Okay, so welcome folks. Um, we prepared a hopefully entertaining talk, which is not quite the complete overview about, oh sorry, OpenMP4 that we promised. It's more like a short stroll along the road of OpenMP4. So, who are we? So right beside to me, there's Michael. Michael works for a big, bear, a big company. And um, whenever we go into this talk to a level where we need technical information, meaning there are things broken in the system or unexplainable behavior or processors are just stupid or whatever, Michael is going to be blamed, but he has also uh, to explain what's going on. Okay, and here on my left, that's Christian Terpofen. Christian is the informed user who finds bug in our products, uh, who has performance problems, and who I'm always helping out uh, just in case. Right, I do have problems, thank you. Ah, uh, I do have a problem here. Oh, right, yeah, that's the Intel legal disclaimer. Uh, we will just keep it in the screen for about 10 seconds for after the fact reading. Thank you. So, let's start with a short motivation for our talk. So, there are some common um, or not so, uncom not so common misbeliefs. One is OpenMP does not scale. So we think that's not correct because first OpenMP is a standard. So how can a standard scale or not scale? So maybe things are not programmed or expressed in the right way. So our aim of this talk is to give you some idea about standard problems and how to avoid them or how to get better performance. Another one is OpenMP is only about for loops and simple work sharing. We will show you that this is not true. And uh, we hope to convince you that at least sometimes OpenMP code, even for C++, can be elegant. Shared memory prioritization will not only be, be about cores. We have to take a look at some of these uh, details that the machines exhibit and some of these properties that can spoil performance. And finally, we will have a glimpse into the future because you don't have to stick with CUDA, OpenCL or other bad, ugly programming models in order to program for accelerators. OpenMP has a solution for that. And this is our agenda. We will talk about the structure of data and memory, how to exploit that in OpenMP to get the right performance. We'll talk about vectorization, meaning simply parallelism, tasking as one of the features. I do my best, okay, to be louder. Tasking of one, one of the features uh, introduced with OpenMP3, and we think it's, uh, it didn't get the uh, attention it should have uh, or it deserves so far. And finally, the accelerator stuff. And let's just uh, jump into the content here. So that's a code where people think it's not really elegant. And I agree. So what that code does is it adds a bounding box of a 2D point cloud. That looks, uh, that, that sounds interesting. In the end, it uh, computes a minimum and maximum. That is what this code is doing. So we have a C++ data structure here, which is named point 2D. And it uh, comes with all the functionalities that you expect. So I can, uh, compute, I can create a variable named lower bound and the one upper bound and I initialize the first with a maximum and the second one with a minimum. And then I have a for loop which employs a C++ iterator uh, that goes through all the point loops, all, all the points in the cloud, sorry, and I will uh, uh, compare my current minimum and maximum with all the points in the cloud to find a way or uh, to basically find the minimum and the maximum. So people believe this cannot be parallelized with OpenMP, but before we take a look how to do that, I will promise you this code actually is pretty slow. And Michael has to explain what is slow, and then we'll take a look back on how to improve this. Yes, and uh, I guess I'm going to be blamed for that the code is slow, but it's actually yeah, the cool. hardware. Uh, so there's a memory hierarchy between the processor and the main memory. So there are registers, caches, and then obviously the capacity main memory. Uh, so whenever you access data, you should keep it as close as possible to the registers. If it doesn't work out in the registers, keep it close to the cache. And only, you know, if the cache doesn't, doesn't work out for you, then you need the data from, from main memory. And this is what, what happening in, the, in this particular code because it's streaming data from the main memory into the cache, into the CPU, and that takes time. Okay, and then there's something called fault sharing. So that, that's happening anytime cores start to share the same cache line. They are working on disjoint data, but in fact, the data is located in the same cache line. So what's happening that the cache line 
is traveling back and forth throughout the system and this is also causing overheads. So it's not actually, you know, the hardware is to blame, but actually the code is doing something wrong here, right? Oh, that's actually a nice animation here. Okay. Yeah, so let me summarize it. If you would build machines as nice as this animation, we wouldn't have the trouble that we are having, right? Okay, so OpenMP3 actually introduced the support for iterator loops in OpenMP. Ah, well, in OpenMP wor work sharing. So the OpenMP do construct for Fortran, uh, in, or in Fortran terminology, the four uh, in C and C++ do support, does support iterator loops if the actual iterator is a random access iterator. So that means there's a, a constant uh, time in order to jump from one element in the iteration space to another one. So you can just write Pragma OMP4 in case of this uh, code snippet here. And the problem that Michael just explains is fault sharing is causing the bad performance in many codes where people try to um, support the reduction of this minimum and maximum by creating an array of the corresponding types and then um, per thread computing a minimum and a maximum and uh, finding the global one in the second step. So if you create an array of the dimension of the number of threads, exactly what Michael just has explained to us will happen. Uh, multiple variables will end up on the same cache line. So in OpenMP4 we are not only we are not uh, eliminating fault sharing, but we bring user-defined reductions. And here, the compiler plus a runtime can do the right thing and give you the best performance. So what we do here is we declare a reduction of a type of a name min p on the variable point to d, and the reduction is a binary operation. So we get an input. Sorry, here's an input, and we get an output. And uh, in this declaration, we define how the operation a reduction operation for two elements of the point to d variable uh, for the name of the reduction min p will be performed. And we will do the same for max p, and then we can write pragma p parallel for reduction min p to compute the lower bound, and max p to compute the upper bound. And uh, that all it takes to parallelize this random access iterator C++ loop um, and to get the right performance and avoid the fault sharing, as just explained. So. What do we have to consider when this point cloud is really, really big? Talking about many, many hundreds of megabytes. Okay, so there's more hardware story to tell. So in fact, every system today is a NUMA system. So that means we have multiple memories that have different latencies, different bandwidth characteristics compared to the other parts of the system. So what's happening, and this is what the operating system actually does, once you do an alloc or mallocation of, of, of uh, data, um, the data is not actually allocated. It's just that the operating system guarantees you that there is a valid pointer behind this data. And once you start touching the data, and I think this is now here, um, the data pages, so the physical pages, are actually allocated somewhere in the system. This is called first touch policy. And what's happening is the core that actually allocates the, 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 the page the first time um, decides on where the page is put. And it's low, usually the local memory that is attached to this particular package or socket, um, as we call it. So the trick here is to actually parallelize data initialization. You do the malloc, and when you touch the data the first time, you parallelize that initialization the same way as you would do the with the computation, making sure that the data stays close to the threads that are actually working on it. Um, so the effect you can see here on that slide. So what's happening is, depending on whether to do the right initialization or a wrong initialization, you get different performance, and it can be up to a factor of two, maybe three, that is going wrong here. Okay, let's see if Christian, my informed user, actually learned something. Yeah, I'm, w I'm working in this uh, thing called the OpenMP Language Committee, and uh, together as a big group, we designed a feature to exploit exactly that. So OpenMP4 brought a thing that we call thread affinity support. 
So we do not want you to worry about how to bind threads to specific cores. What we want you to do is to, about, is to reason about how to distribute threads in the system. So we have a level of abstraction which we call OMP places. OMP places defines a granularity at which you want to perform the binding. And you can put there several different abstract names. You can say sockets and you distribute the threads between sockets. Cores and you're talking about physical cores or threads. Then you're talking hardware threads or hyper threads as your company is calling it. Yep. So what I'm saying here is I want to define how my threads are distributed among the physical cores in the system. I don't care about hyper threads. So that means the threads, the OpenMP threads can roam between the hyper threads in the physical core. And what I'm adding here now is uh, the ProcBind clause. So ProcBind in previous version, versions of OpenMP was either one or uh, zero, meaning on or off. Now we have different thread affinity policies. So spread means I want to spread the threads as far, as far apart as possible on my machine to give me the best memory bandwidth. That means in the case of two threads, they run on two different sockets. And we also have close and master, which will put strings closer together, but not, are not the right um, solution for our problem. So that's nice, but I mean, I'm a user, I always want more performance and I, I, I'm at this conference here and Intel is talking about uh, what they are adding to the proce processors. Can you, can you explain me what's going on here? Sure, you get more performance and the way to get more performance is vectorization. So that's where we execute the same instructions on the same, on the same uh, data, basically. So this is what's happening over the past years, so we've kept been doubling uh, the performance of the system by doubling the vector width over the past couple of years, uh, getting to the extreme of 512 bits per vector on the Xeon Phi code processor. Now that's something that you need to actually program for and most compilers um, did something like this. So you had your for loop, you had to convince the compiler to actually do something about vectorization, to ignore data dependencies, to start vectorization and then also parallelize. Now the problem is with that, you need to trust your co favorite compiler to actually do the right thing. And this is not happening in reality for some cases. So the, the way to solve that is either change the programming model, use something like array notations in C, go for the compiler programmers, or even go low level using something like intrinsics to actually tell the machine more specifically what to do on a very low level. Does that help you? Yeah. So low-level intrinsics, these sound really ugly, but it's very seldom, uh, very rare, that I can tell good, about, good things about the work that you do. But here, there's one thing, because this nice guy contributed to the uh, construct I'm going to explain here. So what we have in OpenMP is explicit SIMD support. So you can put it on four loops and you can also combine it with a parallel and uh, the work sharing constructs. Pragma-OMP SIMD uh, for the loop instruct the compiler to simdize, simdize, how do you call that? Vectorize. Vectorize, thank you, the, uh, the, the following uh, loop. And you can combine it with, for example, the well-known reduction operation in OpenMP. You can instruct it in how many iterations are independent so that the compiler can explicit as much simd parallelism um, as there is in the code. And here, actually, you can express a linear dependency uh, of the variable pointer uh, with respect to the uh, loop index. And there are some more clauses. We don't want to go into detail here. But the good news is that OpenMP4 brought a standardized uh, feature, uh, the SIMD construct, to support vectorization for almost all architectures, at least the ones that we are aware of. And it will be available in all the different compilers supporting OpenMP. So that's the first time that we have an industry standard to express uh, vector level parallelism. Yeah, so. This, is, um, this was really nice, but we had really simple codes. So can we do more interesting things with OpenMP, like the real hard problems, like Sudoku? And we will show you, yeah, we can do that. So in Sudoku, you have the problem that the individual loops are really short. So and in the beginning, I said OpenMP is more than just uh, work sharing of simple loops. So in Sudoku, this is a very simple algorithm. It gives me all the valid uh, results of this Sudoku. I first find an empty field like this one. I insert a number, check the Sudoku. If the number is invalid, I can try the next ones. And here I do have some parallelism. So when trying all the next numbers, I can 
uh, spawn what we call tasks in order uh, to go parallel here. And if it's valid, we continue to the next field. So at the end of this, we, can, uh, we have all valid solutions. There's no big loop. The longest one is probably this one, from 1 to 16 in the case of Sudoku. And I can't parallelize this for this thing like the intro mic, which has way too many threads to deal with for uh, short loops. Okay? And this is a task construct uh, that we have in OpenMP. Tasks basically are all independent from the other task, which is a slightly confusing recursive definition. But if you think about it f for a bit longer, it might be intuitive. So all the tasks are small independent pieces of code and data. And the OpenMP runtime is responsible to schedule them to the threads. With OpenMP tasking, you express a parallelism in the code and you have to trust your runtime to do a good job of scheduling these tasks onto the threads. That's particularly useful for recursive calls because tasks can be nested. So a task can create more tasks, which can create more tasks and so on. And you have the data scoping clauses on these tasks as you know them on the task construct as you know them from the other uh, constructs. I don't go into syntax uh, details here. Uh, just two more things at the task wait. We will see it on the next slide. We can wait for all the tasks that we created. So only the ch direct child tasks, not all the other ones. And at the barrier, after the barrier, when all threads have reached them, all the tasks are guaranteed uh, to complete. So this is how task parallel Sudoku looks like in OpenMP. First, we need a parallel region, which is a construct that gives us a team of threads. We always need a team of threads in OpenMP to do something in parallel. But as my algorithm here starts with a single field and starts to insert the first number, mainly one, we have a Pragma OMP single here. So that means the parallel region will be created, but only one thread will start with the first step in my algorithms. All the others will jump around and they are ready to take a look at some imaginary work queue. So that means as soon as tasks have been created, uh, these threads waiting at the end of the single or maybe even at the end of the parallel region can pick up these tasks and bring them to execution. I said already on the previous slide that these checking of uh, or the validation of the other numbers are the individual tasks, meaning the individual work packages. So this is where we use the Pragma B task construct, uh, which will create um, a set of uh, uh, Sudoku board copies and so on. And finally, we have to wait uh, at the end to um, print out all the, re uh, all the solutions that we have found. We have a code uh, view here as well. So that's Pragma OMP parallel, Pragma OMP single, as just explained. Solve parallel is a function call that will uh, go through all the uh, possible uh, Sudoku fields, try all the possible solutions. This is what I just explained. And uh, here you actually see the task construct. So the Sudoku is actually a pointer. I capture the pointer with the first private construct, use the C++ copy constructor to get a new Sudoku board, and at the end I wait. That's all it takes. If you're interested in the code, let, send me an email, and I will answer with the code. It's uh, open source. So we think tasking is a really powerful construct in OpenMP. If you have any irregular problems, give it a try. If you have a for loop, stick with the work sharing constructs. But I still sometimes, not necessarily for Sudoku, sometimes I need more power. Do you have something for me? All right, I have something for you, buddy. Uh, so there are accelerators and coprocessors. So basically, we are now entering the world of hybrid programming. Oh. And I think you brought us a, 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 no, 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 a no, simple have a example. example for that, right? Oh, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> there it is. So this particular code is really, really compute intensive and really important. Um, it's a median filter. So what I want to do is I want to get the median. Uh, color value of all the neighboring pixels here. So that's very good for photoshopping you out of the photos that I have with me together here. So what I do is I get the color of all the neighboring pixels, sort them as scanning and uh, choose a new color value to be actually the medium here. And then I do the update. Simple algorithm. If you implement that, you can make use of uh, Pragma OMP Parallel 4, the well-known work sharing construct. And here it does a bitonic sorting. And it's a long code, it's a long loop, and it takes long on your sometimes slow processors. Know what? Are you kidding me? No. Okay, so let's get this thing done 
on the Xeon Phi coprocessor. So here's the model that we are looking at. So OpenMP4 introduces support for accelerators and coprocessors, not necessarily restricted to Xeon Phi coprocessors, but of course Intel supports them fully here. Uh, the device model basically is we have one single host that executes everything uh, in terms of no regular multi-threading what we execute today on, on Xeon processors, for example. And then there are multiple accelerators or coprocessors, and the only restriction here is you can have as many of them as you want, but they need to be of the same kind. So only Xeon Phi coprocessors or other types of accelerators of the same architecture. Okay, and this is how you actually get this uh, piece of code over to the coprocessor. Now there's a new construct introduced with OpenMP4. Uh, it's called OpenMP Target. Uh, what it does, it tells the runtime system and the compiler to send an instruction stream over from the host to a target device, execute it there, and then bring control back to the host, right? That's the easy part. Now, every code needs to work on data, except for Hello World, and this still works on data, namely Hello World. Um, so we have a map clause where you can tell how to map the data from the host into the target device. There are directions, in, out, and in, out, in, transfer from the host to the device, out, transfer back, and in, out, you know, do the, the natural thing, transfer it over, compute, and transfer it back, okay? Uh, we stick that in front of the Perl 4, and that's basically all you need to do for now. Uh, the compiler will take care of compiling that particular code for the coprocessor, send it over, spawn the parallelism on the coprocessor, execute in Perl, and then return back. There is also a way to avoid unnecessary copies. So usually in typical applications, what you do is you transfer back and forth between the host and the coprocessor because it's not so shiny and, and, and bright uh, in terms of code that you can execute everything on the coprocessor. There are still parts that you want to keep on the host. So what you do is you can then allocate a target region, a, a target data region, which uh, enables you to buffer data on the coprocessor. You can offload into the target region. Um, the, the data is already there. You can compute there. You return to the host. You can update things. Uh, you can transfer data back and forth as on a needed basis. And you can selectively keep data over on the coprocessor. Uh, let me show you how that works in terms of a more visual experience. So we have a pointer. Yes. Isn't that visual? That's visual. Nice um, Stop interrupting me, buddy. Um, so we have the host, um, which has some data pointer. Um, we map it to uh, the coprocessor. That, having said that, it's transferred over. We execute some code on the coprocessor. And then when we're done, we're transferring data back from, from the target device back to the host. OK, and then we're done. OK, that was our short tour through OpenMP4. There is more. So we skipped a, a lot of in, uh, details on, on the syntax. Um, there are reference cards that you can find at www.openmp.org. Uh, please feel free to download them. They're for C, C++, and Fortran. And of course, new thing at supercomputing, we have TR3 out. So that's the first step towards OpenMP41, which will add great new features. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It was a pleasure. Are there questions? Right. When is the free beer? Now. Until <laughs> four. Ah, damn it. I have